Um, hello, everyone. Uh, you probably know I'm Margaret Crawford, and I'm very happy to introduce another Margaret, Margaret Morton. Uh, and I was very excited when I saw the CIRC lecture series uh, because I saw Margaret Morton's name there. And uh, I knew of her through her book, which is uh, the very remarkable book, uh, Transitory Gardens, Uprooted Lives, which came out last year. Um, a book that I saw in the Yale University Press catalog, and I immediately rushed out and bought it. And for those who don't know the book, uh, it's a book about gardens that homeless people have made in New York City. Uh, it's a joint effort with uh, uh, Diana Balmori, who is a landscape architect who teaches at Yale. And, just to, and it's got Margaret Morton's photographs in it. Margaret Morton um, teaches, uh, she's an associate professor at the Cooper Union in New York. And a large part of the text is made up of the words of the people who made these gardens. And uh, this book really excited me and inspired me for a whole series of different reasons. First of all, the gardens themselves uh, and their stories are, are really very moving and uh, wonderful. And they demonstrate an astonishing creativity in creating environments in the midst of what I would say were astonishingly uh, unpromising circumstances. Uh, the gardens are, uh, in some cases, very beautiful. In most cases, very strange. Uh, they're inventive. Uh, they're personal. They're very expressive. Uh, and overall, I think, uh, extraordinarily inspiring. And they've certainly in expanded my own notions of the possibilities of urban life and of the urban landscape. Um, there are things you might walk by and not really notice. And yet, if you went back and took a close look, as these photographs do, uh, you would see that there's an, a, an amazing amount there. And certainly, the photographs bear very eloquent witness um, to these places. Uh, another reason as a history and theory instructor that I appreciate this book is because I think the concept of the book is also a very sophisticated one. Uh, the authors are really very successful in avoiding a lot of the traps that come with, I think, dealing with homeless people in fiction or uh, television, uh, in, in, in which they really pr don't presume to present them to us. Uh, the gardens, in a sense, speak for these people. And it, so, in a sense, they're not sentimentalized. Uh, they're not presented as a social problem. And at the same time, they're not aestheticized. The gardens aren't seen or categorized as some kind of naive art or folk art. Instead, the gardens are really used in the book as a way of expanding our ideas, not only about homeless people, uh, but, about, but about people in general, and also about gardens. Um, but they really give us a new sense of a lot of uh, existing categories and expand them uh, and really make us think in a new way about what beauty is like, uh, what creativity is like, what urban space and community might be like uh, in a city. And so I think that this is really a very extraordinary achievement. So I'm really pleased to welcome Margaret Morton to SciArc. Thank you, Margaret. And I'd like to thank the Student Lecture Committee and Aaron for their graciousness and asking me to come speak. I'm just going to start right in with the slides. In 1989, I began a photographic documentation of a homeless community of over 150 individuals who had taken up residence in New York City's Tompkins Square Park, which at that time had become a national symbol for the plight of the homeless. These makeshift dwellings, primarily created from consumer detritus, reconstituted as building materials, went far beyond the need for mere shelter and gave evidence of the profound need to adorn, collect, and create, even in the most desperate of circumstances. The desire to bring personal meaning to a private space underscored the diversity that was exemplified in the selection of the sites, building materials, and personal collections. 
all scavenged from the streets of New York City. This fundamental need manifested itself in such individualized expressions as Christmas decorations, fragments of religious artifacts, gardens of carefully dried leaves and bits of metal, or perhaps just a carefully selected faded flowered sheet tucked beneath a more functional plastic tarpaulin. Discarded office furniture, broken statues, bits of carpet, and a metal oil drum for warmth and outdoor cooking often defined a yard around the structures and painfully symbolized the suburban dream. Many of the park residents stated that they preferred constructing their own houses to staying in the city's shelter system. Their reasons were compelling. Although makeshift plastic tents and plywood shanties are certainly not acceptable housing alternatives, it is my hope that the analysis of the details that transform a cardboard box into a home will provide useful insights as more appropriate solutions to the housing crisis are developed. Nathaniel's Garden. Nathaniel was an individual from Tompkins Square Park whom I've been able to re remain in contact with for over four years, despite his many relocations. But I first met him in Tompkins Square Park. Nathaniel was nicknamed the mayor because he often served as the representative of the 100 or so homeless residents of the park. He also had the largest home in the park. It even had a garden. In his own words, I built a tent around a park bench. I had a garden outside. I've got a place. I've got a garden. Two or three big sunflowers came up there from seeds. I had a praying mantis there. I found it on the other side of the fence, caught it, and put it in a cage. I would bring it out to play in the garden in the daytime. At night, I would put it on a stick and put him back in his cage. At 6 o'clock in the morning on December 14th, in 14-degree weather, the residents of Tompkins Square Park awoke to riot police and were forced to evacuate. They fled with the few possessions that they could quickly gather or just watched in horror as their dwellings were ground up in garbage trucks. After the park was cleared, many of the former park residents relocated in the nearby city-owned vacant lots. The communities quickly built more permanent dwellings than they had been permitted to construct in Tompkins Square Park. At the same time, homeless individuals were establishing other homes along the waterfronts, underneath the bridges, inside the structural supports for the bridges, and deep into the underground tunnels. One of the tunnel residents has lived underground for over 20 years. At this time, I also began audio taping oral histories of the builders. One of the most rewarding aspects of this project has been to create a photographic record as people literally rebuild their lives, constructing homes for themselves when no alternatives have been made available by the city. The piles of trash along the streets of New York City, the refuse of those more fortunate, is scavenged, then lovingly reconstructed into homes. But all of our homes are but illusions of permanence, and these fragile dwellings are certainly no exception. In the words of Moses, who lived in the Ninth Street lot, Majority of time, you know, I think people got the wrong idea. Like some of them, they've got the wrong perception of the homeless people. They think a lot of homeless people are drug addicts, bums, whatnot. You just got people that don't want to go through the system. Because you go through the system, it's rough. The system don't treat people right. So they say, well, you know, it's better to live out there than in one of them shelters. A man can't live like that. First of all, a man need a private room. He need a sink. He need a sanctuary. Not in the open place where he's being ushered around by security guards. Shut up. Get in line. Don't tell me nothing. Throw him out. I find that instead of living in a shelter, I would rather build my own little tent. 
I've stayed there in the wintertime. I've stayed there in the summer. I've kept myself healthy and clean. The advantage is that sometimes you find a mattress, you find a chair or something, and you take it in there and put it inside your own little tent and make it like a home. There's ladies there. There's guys there. We all know each other. We socialize with each other. We have to use fire hydrants to drink water from and wash ourselves from. Jimmy's Garden. I first met Jimmy on July 3rd, 1991, through another homeless man who thought I should know about his special, unusual garden. Over a period of four months, he had created a fish pond with a house and a vegetable garden in the background on a vacant lot on New York City's Lower East Side. On July 11th, I returned to visit bearing copies of the photographs I had taken and a tape recorder so that I might document some of Jimmy's recollections of growing up in the South. I also brought him a journal because he had expressed an interest in writing down some of his experiences as a homeless man. When I arrived, his tent, vegetable garden, and fish pond had been bulldozed. It seemed as if they had never existed. I wandered the area asking if anyone had seen him, what had happened to him. I was informed that there had been no warning of the demolition and that he had disappeared in despair. James's Garden. For James Hayward, eviction from Tompkins Square Park meant returning to exactly the same spot he had occupied four years earlier. But this time, he created a garden. I got a garden, a nice little garden in the front. It keeps me busy, and I pick all kinds of toys to put in the garden to make the garden look good. We draw pictures from South Africa, and we draw pictures from all over. If there's no rain, we work on it every day. Four of us work on the garden, but most of the time it's just me. I keep it clean. If we don't have it clean, they'll start complaining. And mostly everybody right now, they say, your garden look very clean. It don't look like the rest of that yard over there. If we keep it clean, the city, they won't bother us. And we have all kinds of things in the garden. We have a lady head with a knife, with a gun pointing at her. And that's for a reason, because a lot of people know that that means trouble. Even the cop, he knows what it means. That's for a meaning. Away, away, folks. And we leave it outside at nighttime, and nobody touch it. And we got a black arm in the back. We've got a lot of things in the garden. A lot of art, a lot of drawing. And like I said, it's beautiful. On October 15, 1991, the lot was unexpectedly bulldozed by the city. James salvaged a few personal effects, but he was not able to save his beloved painted rocks. He returned to find them in fragments. Angelo's Garden. I met Angelo Aldi in early spring 1992. He had built a tiny house at the end of an abandoned pier that jutted out into the Hudson River. It was Easter Sunday. He was grateful for a visitor and told me about his past. The reason I came to Pier 84 was when I was on Social Security from 1983 to 1990, I was getting $510 a month, and I was paying $115 a week for a hotel in Coney Island. So that left me to eat only $5 a day. By the time I paid my medicine and the hotel, I had nothing. I met a friend who said, come down to Pier 84 in Manhattan. I'm from Naples. I came when I was 18, worked as a cook for a while, worked in lots of things, had my own restaurant, little place for a while. Then from age 55, nobody wants to give me a job. Who's going to hire me? Outside my house, I have two gardens. It's not a garden, actually. No flowers or tomatoes or eggplants. It's a toy garden. 
I've got a gorilla, Godzilla, a Barbie doll, and lots and lots of toys. A lot of people come by over here. They come over here and say, where did you get all this stuff? I say, I didn't buy them. It's like a museum. And nobody touches my garden. It's got a snake fence. Snake take care of things, see? I found that out. The Hill. Since the mid-1980s, plywood shacks have been constructed on a steeply sloped triangular plot of land known as the Hill, adjacent to the Manhattan Bridge and bypassed by a steady stream of traffic from Brooklyn that poured into the heart of Chinatown. The Hill evolved into one of the more permanent homeless commun communities of New York City. I photographed the hill on a regular basis, beginning in February 1991. I relied on Louis Watson, who had been staying at the hill since 1987, to tell me about the earlier days. We used to call this Rat's Hotel. Nobody was up here except for about six of us. We used to bring mattresses up here and throw them down on the ground. But the reason we called it Rat's Hotel was because there used to be thousands of rats, and we'd bring them up donuts and bread and throw it to them to keep them away from us. And we'd just lay there on the mattresses, this was in summertime, and just drink our beer and talk our talk and fantasize, talking about this or that. Off and on, I would get myself together, go to work, and leave for a few months. And then eventually I'd come back, and there was one shack here. Somebody had moved in. Then I'd come back again, and there'd be two shacks. And then eventually, it just kept accumulating. It just kept accumulating until now, you can't hardly breathe in here. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee was a Chinese man who immigrated to New York by way of Cuba in the mid-1960s. He became homeless in the late 1980s. He constantly changed the exterior of his hut, which was covered with large Chinese characters and bound with brightly covered straps. Sammy, a neighbor, informed me that I would not find one nail or board holding Mr. Lee's place together. It was all tied together with knots. Mr. Lee's life evolved around the creation and ongoing recreation of his home. He would leave the hill early in the morning and wander the streets of Chinatown carrying burlap rice sacks and spend the day scavenging for treasures to tie onto his house. At dusk, he would return and with great ceremony reach deep into his rice sacks and pull out his treasures and tie them to the outside, completely transforming his home once again. At five o'clock in the morning on May 29, 1992, an arsonist set fire to Mr. Lee's home. He died in the blaze. A neighbor who had also lost his home in the fire and barely survived constructed a memorial to Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee's death was followed by several departures from the hill, but a steady stream of newcomers soon doubled the population. When Louis was feeling well enough, he constructed houses for them. He told me that he'd been promised five bucks a house, but that nobody ever paid him. The newcomers had very little interest in gardens. I continued to visit the hill, and on the anniversary of Mr. Lee's death, placed flowers where his home had been. Despite the influx of new residents, the site had been left untouched. The only attempt to build there was interrupted by yet another fire. After that, folks decided it was best to leave that site alone. On August 17, 1993, I visited the hill for the last time to bear witness as the entire village was demolished by city bulldozers. The residents fled and still live along the streets nearby. 
The most recent homeless community to be demolished was located in a city-owned vacant lot on the Lower East Side. The earliest residents moved there in 1987 from Tompkins Square Park. They had been born in Puerto Rico and had come to New York with dreams of a better life. Their houses were continually undergoing construction, bearing a closer resemblance to the architecture of their homeland with each addition. Brightly painted houses flew the Puerto Rican flag. Intricately detailed open porches, gaily striped awnings, and painted rock gardens provided sharp contrast to the neighborhood's grim tenement buildings and combined with the salsa music that filled the air on weekends to evoke memories of a happier time. I first came upon the lot in June 1991 and visited several times a week, establishing a rapport with the residents. They came to accept my continued presence and generously permitted me to document their lives while they constructed their dwellings, planted their gardens, cooked their meals, married and had families. There was not only a sense of community among the homeless residents, but with the neighbors in the surrounding tenements as well, who would often join them to play dominoes or join in the music that filled the air on weekends. Gineo was one of the earliest residents. I built this house myself. I started it. I carry all these things myself, over here, from the street, from everywhere. Found them on 8th Avenue, 1st Avenue. Every piece of wood, I found it. Everything, I take it, little by little, little by everything. I carried it all for more than two years. The first time that I move over here, I start like a poor person. Now I feel better. Now I feel comfortable. Nobody bother me. I have to do it because I'm an old man already. I'm on to 55. Too much for me. For me, it's like 100. This is my work. I can't work here. I can't work there. This is something I've got to do with my life. I figure if I don't do something here, my mind will die. I am my own boss, and I know what I have to do what I need, what I don't need. I don't call nobody to help me. I figure this is my breakthrough to stay here because I believe in God. But sooner or later, they're going to chop these houses down. Who will come to tear me down? Will they put something here for the people working hard? They've suffered making these houses here, you know. Another resident, Pepe Otero moved into an existing plywood dwelling and over a period of four years completely transformed it from a one-room shack to a five-room home. I'm no architect. God is the architect. He is the best, the best architect in town. Well, when I took this over, it was nothing, nothing. It had so many leaks, leaking all over, and too low. I had to push it up two inches more. I came to this country because somebody told me, oh, you could make a lot of money in New Jersey in typesetting. I said, oh yeah, then I'll go to New York. When I came to New York, I got a big bad surprise because in those times, the minimum salary was $34 a week. I was making more money than that in Puerto Rico. The kitchen is still unfinished. I have to finish the kitchen. Then I'm going to start the bathroom, soon as the weather gets a little warmer, if I'm still alive. On December 15, 1993, in the early morning hours, this community was demolished by the city bulldozers. The residents had been notified of the impending destruction, but because they had been offered no acceptable alternatives other than the shelter system, few heeded the warnings. They were really left with only a few moments to salvage their belongings before the bulldozers arrived. The grinding noise was deafening, and the fragility of these illusions of home had never been more apparent. 
It took only minutes for each dwelling to be demolished. And as I watched these symbols of permanence, which had sustained this community of people for over six years, they became piles of refuse once again. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Oh, you have a question? <laughs> well, um, somewhat in this, after the after two of the demolitions, my photographs have been published in the newspapers showing another point of view about the people with quotes of the, you know, from the people. And, um, but that's a little bit after the fact. Uh, they will be used in a lawsuit that Coalition for the Homeless is bringing against the city. Um, the photographs that will be used will be photographs that I have of people living in that I've photographed over four years living in five and six different locations just to prove that bulldozing people and chasing them away from their um, homes that they've created really isn't solving the problem that they just relocate in other places. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. The, the question was, do the people express any desire to live anywhere else other than these shanties? Uh, do you mean outside of New York City? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, um, well, they would all like an apartment and, and housing in New York City, but um, there really isn't a low rent or low income kind of option. I mean, these people have no source of income at all, and so there really isn't a way for them to, to get any housing in New York City unless they would go through the shelter system. And these are people that have tried it and find that it's just too dangerous. And um, so they've, they've chosen this alternative uh, because there really isn't another one. But they, but they really don't want to be living on the street. I mean, they're not nomadic people or they're not some nomadic tribe that, w that, that likes to be in transition. These are people that did have families and s jobs and, and very solid lives and then um, a variety of, of circumstances kind of brought them to that, this level of living. But um, although they, they evoke their homelands in their architecture, when I do ask them, you know, why don't you consider going back to the south where you're from or to Puerto Rico, because they do speak very fondly of their homelands, they usually say that they just can't admit to their families that they failed, you know, that they came to New York and failed. And they do hold the whole dream of New York City and being part of New York City uh, very much alive, which is, which is interesting considering how battered they've been by the city and the circumstances of the city, but, but they still really hang on to that dream of, of living in New York and things working out for them in, t in New York. And, and so they're really not likely to ever leave the city, no matter what happens to them. Okay. What happened to the site? Oh, the hill. Um, the site that's the um, Manhattan Bridge where it spills out onto Canal Street, it's currently just chain link fenced. Uh, the city put up chain link fence um, later in the afternoon of the day they bulldozed it and nothing has happened to the site. Uh, there is work being done on the Manhattan Bridge and um, they used that 
is one of the excuses for clearing the site, but they're actually not using that site for anything. And the, and the work on the bridge is not in that part of the bridge. Oh, that's also just an abandoned vacant lot right now. There's nothing on that lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a question over here. Okay. Okay, um, the question was about my method of documentation. Um, I document photographically and I do audio taped oral histories. Um, I take measurements of many of the structures and um, I don't draw them in terms of um, beyond doing kind of simple floor plans and, and measurements and uh, I mean the, the building materials and how the building materials are acquired are of great interest to me and so I, I document that as part of the process also. Okay. Okay, the question is about the architecture of despair and, and what it will consist of in, in terms of the analysis. Uh, the architecture of despair w will begin in, with Tompkins Square Park in, in 1989 and it will track um, various homeless communities throughout New York City and then it will go all the way to 1994, maybe even, um, well, probably fall 94 in terms of its analysis, um, it will have all the sites that are mentioned here and then several others. Um, there'll be a lot more information about the tunnels, the underground tunnels, and um, these various people. I mean, one thread that will tie the architecture of despair together will be the fact that some of the people that lived in Tompkins Square Park have lived in five and six different sites by now. and so they will, individuals will weave some of the chapters together. Mm -hmm. Okay, was there a question in the back? Okay. The question is, does the documentation extend beyond Manhattan to the boroughs? And um, my documentation to date has primarily been in Manhattan just because there's so much there that I want to document and still am documenting. Um, but there are homeless communities and have always been in Brooklyn. Um, there was a homeless community that was destroyed by fire this fall in Brooklyn this winter. Um, in which a woman was killed. And there are communities, certainly in the Bronx, and uh, there's a, quite a big community developing in the Bronx. And as the city is bulldozing the communities that I've been following, I am moving to the boroughs and, and moving further afield and also moving deeper underground. Um, and as the homeless people are being driven out of view, they're being driven to the water's edge to the East River, the Hudson River, underground, and to the boroughs. And so that will certainly affect my documentation.
I don't know if you could hear that, but the comment was that um, as the city bulldozes these people away, they're really running out of options, and where will they be heading, uh, where will they be going? And um, I can tell you a little bit about where they're headed. Uh, people are being driven into abandoned buildings, and um, the pop population of a tunnel that I've been photographing in since 1991 has increased. Uh, it's practically doubled. Um, people are found more under bridges. It's, it's very difficult to actually create a homeless community or a settlement now because the city moves in pretty quickly. So individuals are being more scattered. But some of the people that lived up at the hill, Louis Watson, whom I quoted extensively, um, spent this winter, which was bitter cold in New York, living in a cardboard box in um, a park that's in Chinatown and is really very unhealthy now. And he actually had a life on the hill. He was kind of the master builder of the shanties on the hill and had a sense of identity and was a long-term resident and had a sense of authority, actually, in the community. And now he's really someone who's just living in a cardboard box and under a piece of plastic along the street. And so he really um, is just one example of, of how people's lives are really uh, much more difficult now that they've been driven out of the homeless community that they created and built for themselves. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. The primary reason for the city to come in and bulldoze a homeless community is the fact that neighbors, uh, people in neighboring areas have been complaining. And one reason the hill was left for 10 years was that it was just on this parcel of land alongside the bridge. And so uh, nobody was looking onto it from their apartment building. And um, the homeless community that was known as Bushville, the, the Puerto Rican homeless community, that was left alone for so long because it was really just surrounded by tenements. But then they started to um, renovate a couple of the tenements that overlooked the site. And blank walls that used to overlook the site suddenly were pierced with windows. And then at that time, those people started to complain. But it, it was really um, a sense, you know, it's NIMBY, not in my backyard. It was a case of uh, low-income people that had been uh, given low-income housing and didn't want to look at homeless people. And um, it, it was really very tragic because, a lot, you know, there were a lot of fights and com community kind of block association fights over getting rid of them. And it was pretty unanimous to get rid of them. There was an incredible lack of compassion for these people. And the people in that vacant lot were people that came to America moved to the Lower East Side and raised their families on the Lower East Side and then became homeless. And so they were really not a homeless encampment that moved into a neighborhood, but they were people from the neighborhood who became destitute and, and just stayed in the neighborhood but had to move out of their apartments. OK. I'm sorry? Yes. Oh. OK. Um, the question was, um, do my students at Cooper Union um, develop a sense of community or a sense of working in the community uh, because of my work? Um, I try to really encourage my students to have some community service as part of their work. Um, I don't encourage them to necessarily um, you know, go out and, and work in situations that they might be uncomfortable with. But we do a project with PS19, which is um, an elementary school nearby where the children haven't had an art program in several years and um, they're disadvantaged economically. And so there's kind of a sense of social purpose that comes with some of our class projects. But um, I really don't impose that on them. I, I think if, if they get excited about it and want to get involved in it, I think that's great. Um, if you've ever been to the Lower East Side, which is where the Cooper Union is located, 
you'll know that it's pretty difficult to even walk to class without seeing homeless people and seeing people that are struggling with drug problems. And uh, I, w I always feel that all the problems of the, the nation are uh, kind of collected there right around the school so that everyone can see them and think about them and, and try to solve them. And that's, to me, one of the strengths of the location of the school. But it's, it's all around the students while they're walking to the school. And so I would like to think that my work makes them realize that they can be part of the analysis and solution. OK? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the question was, how did I start the project? Um, was, I teach at the Cooper Union, which is located in the Lower East Side, just a few blocks from Tompkins Square Park. And in 1989, there were 150 people living in the park in about 72 dwellings. And I knew that they were threatened with eviction. And I felt that it was really important that someone document them um, in terms of the architecture of the homeless people, what they'd created for themselves. Because I found that when I went to the park and talked to the people, they were actually very proud of what they'd created and would tell me very specifically what they found and where they found it, why they had decided to create their dwelling the way they did. And so that even though people were talking about it as a bunch of um, garbage in the park and how terrible it looked, that there was a real sense of pride and order and um, the fact that Nathaniel, whose garden I showed you, um, felt that he had to sweep the whole area in front of his tent before I could photograph it. There was a real sense of pride. and. I felt it was important to document them before they were destroyed. And I really thought that would be the end of my project. It would be just this one-time project that I would do. And then I realized once the park residents were evicted that people kept relocating. And then I just kept following them. And, and that just kept leading me to other sites. So I, I didn't really plan on it to be this long-term project. And so it's taken me in to a lot of different directions that I really hadn't anticipated. And I think that's something I'd really like to pass on, is just if something starts to lead you in a direction that you hadn't planned on, but it feels like the right thing to be doing, then you don't have to really ask yourself a lot of questions about, you know, how does this fit in with my earlier work or anything. I, I just, I never looked back. I just went with this project and, and what it meant to me. And I, I felt it was changing my life, and, and it was having a big am impact on my, my own person and how I related to people and things. I had a very formalist training, and suddenly I was in a very difficult kind of emotional, highly emotionally charged situation with people whose lives were really on the line every night and every moment. And, um, and I, I found that was such a compelling, powerful experience that, that I really had no reason to look back and try to put it in a context of what I had been doing, but just let it change my life and, and go with that. <laughs>